Great. Uh, welcome, everybody, um, to this session on security and securing DHIS2. Um, this will be a pretty high level kind of overview session, particularly around the um, new processes that are being implemented uh, by the DHS2 core team and what that means for implementations. Um, there's obviously a huge depth of uh, information that we could uh, talk about when it comes to security and privacy uh, and how to implement those in uh, implementations. Uh, DHS2 servers, as well as just uh, user management uh, processes in, in uh, countries and in uh, implementations that are running DHS2 servers. Um, as, as Bob uh, is, is, uh, uh, likes, to, likes to remind us, that could be a whole week-long session by itself, and probably we should have one of those sessions at some point in the near future. Um, so look forward to that. But this is just one hour, so we'll just do a high-level overview. Um, I'm going to start with some security principles that are uh, what we, as the um, as the core group, uh, as particularly the security team that has been developed uh, and, and uh, formalized here at the at the the core team, um, are trying to embody and to uh, evangelize in the community. So the first of those is robust, formal, and predictive predictable security policy uh, processes. Sorry, my uh, uh, video is in the way, uh, processes. Um, and this is particularly important so that uh, it, you know what is going to happen when a vulnerability uh, is detected in uh, the DHS2 software or when something goes wrong. Uh, we know what to do and everyone in the community knows what will take place. Um, that goes along also with maximum transparency, which is uh, just like it sounds, trying to be as open and uh, clear as possible about what ha what happens in the uh, the process for addressing vulnerabilities or dealing with security issues, and uh, particularly with um, what happens after the vulnerability has been um, identified and fixed and disclosed. Uh, going back and, and exposing or, or uh, sharing the process that went into that, what we learned during that process, uh, and so on. I mentioned disclosure. Um, this is something that's relatively new for the core team, but we are working on uh, developing a process for full and responsible disclosure of all vulnerabilities in the DHS2 software. So when something uh, is uh, discovered, a vulnerability is discovered in, in the software, um, we will address it. We will uh, spend a, a fair amount of time trying to make sure that vulnerable implementations have time to upgrade before that disclosure. Uh, but the goal is to always disclose those vulnerabilities in a responsible way uh, to the public so that they are uh, fully available and, and readily um, uh, accessible to everyone in that community. Uh, and the fourth principle here is to advocate for and to embody a strong security management culture. Uh, this is not only applicable to the DHS2 core team and the security team itself, but also to all of the implementation teams and groups around the world that are building security practices on top of DHS2 software. Um, so we hope to not only uh, lead by example in, in that sense by building our own se strong security management culture, but also to advocate for the adoption of that security management culture in implementations. So we're gonna talk about a few things today. Um, we'll talk about uh, what, what it entails uh, when we say DHS2 security. There's a number of different pieces within that um, and we're gonna focus mostly on software security today, but we'll, we'll talk about what the other pieces are as well. Um, we'll introduce the security team, what that means, who they are, uh, and what, what they do. Um, one of the things that they do is vulnerability management, which is a, a formalized process and a policy for uh, how we deal with vulnerabilities when they are uh, reported to the DHS2 core team uh, or discovered by an implementation and, and shared with us. Um, how we go about uh, triaging it, fixing it, disclosing it, um, and we'll even we'll talk about how that actually has played out in practice in in the last uh, just a couple of weeks. 
And then we will share a bit about what it looks like to secure DHIS2 for a particular implementation. So this is on top of um, hardening the DHIS2 core software uh, to prevent vulnerability, in, 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 intrinsic vulnerabilities in that software, but also building the processes and the, the group of people and the policies on top of that software in implementations to be able to actually uh, have secure implementations of DHS2. And then we'll see where we're going from here uh, and what, how we look forward. So what does it mean to be uh, security for DHS2? There are a number of components of this, uh, what we call DHS2 security. And the one that we're going to focus most on today is software hardening. Um, I'm not sure if that's exactly the right term, but that's what, I, what I've been calling it. Uh, and this deals with vulnerability management. So if there is a, uh, a vulnerability in the software, in the way the software has been built, um, then that is something that could be uh, fixed and hardened the software to pr protect against uh, bad actors or hackers or people that are trying to do things that they shouldn't uh, in a DHS2 system. And these are things that uh, are basically functionalities of the DHS2 core software. It's not something that you build on top of it. Um, we also talk a little bit about software security features. Um, we've started to uh, really lay these out on our, our new uh, security website, which I will introduce a little bit later as well. Um, but these are things like user management, sharing settings, integrity checks, and data loss prevention. And those are all uh, things that DHIS2 can do in order to uh, allow an implementation to implement secure practices to have fine-grained privacy practices and control uh, over their users and those types of things. Similarly, data privacy practices is a little bit more than security, which is who has access to what, but privacy is who, what, where, where data can go, um, who, who has access to it, how do we know who has accessed it and who has changed it. Um, and this is particularly applicable to uh, PII or personally identifiable information. In the case of tracker programs, this is uh, becoming more and more prevalent. Um, and the final piece here is information security management. Um, this is sort of the soft security uh, practices, um, which is the people around the, the DHS2 software um, and the processes that are built around it in order to have a, a, a culture of security. Um, Security is much more than just software. It also is almost, I would say, more important to have the right people and the processes and knowledge of what's going on um, more than just having uh, uh, functionally secure software. And again, all of these apply not only to the DHS2 core team, but also to individual DHS2 implementations, which Bob will talk about a, a little bit later. Next, I'll introduce the security team. So. DHS2 has had a security group or, or people that deal with security for quite a long time, um, but it hasn't had a formalized, uh, clearly defined uh, team that focuses on this and is, is clearly the ones responsible for when a vulnerability comes in or something like that. Um, and so we've recently created that official security team. Uh, it's a, got a well-known membership list, which means that we know exactly who is on that team, who is responsible for what when a, when a report comes in. Um, and the initial focus of that team is on software security, which is uh, distinct from data privacy, distinct from software management practices, um, though we are doing a bit of all of those. Um, and what we're focusing on primarily, on, in the initial focus at least, uh, with this security team is on the development process and prioritization of the core software, how we embed security into all of the features that we build, um, how we manage and disclose vulnerabilities that are reported against the DHS2 software, and how we support and promote best practices for DHS2 implementations that are actually running production instances in the field. Again, this doesn't mean that data privacy is less important than software security. Uh, I'll get into more about this a, a little bit later. Um, 
privacy is something that is addressed by the core team as well as DHS2 implementations around the world every day. Um, but you can't really have a strong privacy if you don't have a foundation of secure software. If you, there are holes in your software that will leak information, it's very hard to build privacy practices on top of that. So the initial focus of the security team is to harden the software in order to build a foundation for uh, very strong data privacy practices going forward. I'll talk a little bit now about the vulnerability management um, that we have started to implement here with that, that new security team. We've built a, a process. This is a rough uh, kind of overview of that process, but this goes from the moment a vulnerability is reported to the moment it is disclosed to the public and all the steps that need to need to happen along the way, um, as well as uh, gets into who's who's kind of responsible for each, where what where we have the different um, choices along the way of what makes a critical vulnerability versus one that we need to fix but isn't as critical that it needs to be out the next day. Um, there's a, there's a whole process that goes on under this. It's something that we have developed and we have started to implement in practice and are iterating and, and learning as we go as well. Uh, we also published a new vulnerability management policy on our website, and this is targeted at security researchers, hackers, auditors, uh, anybody that might be reporting a vulnerability against DHS2. It explains some of the process that we described uh, in, in the previous slide. Uh, and it also defines the scope of what, what we actually consider core software vulnerabilities. Um, so there are a lot of things that might be reported as a vulnerability, but are not something that's, um, uh, that's actually a vulnerability in the software itself. Those are things like the configuration of the play DHS2 instance, or the, uh, the configuration of an, an email server, or some uh, test instance that is set up by, by DHS2. Um, so there are a lot of things that are out of scope, but it also explicitly defines the things that are in scope, which is if there is a, a flaw in the, the functionality of DHS2 that will expose some information that it should not, uh, that is considered something that we can report as a vulnerability and address accordingly. So putting this into practice, um, we had the opportunity, uh, I, I'll say, to put our rather new vulnerability management process to the test uh, just a couple weeks ago when we uh, discovered a vulnerability or had a vulnerability reported to us um, around June 8th. It was a, a pretty serious vulnerability. Um, and we very quickly were able to identify what the issue was uh, and merge a fix for it into the, the root of DHS2. Um, this is uh, something that we, is a, a learning experience for us, but we actually merged that into the, the core DHS2 repository, which had been the, the practice for some time. Um, but we're trying to kind of uh, harden not only our software, but also our processes so that we don't inadvertently disclose vulnerabilities before they're uh, announced to the, the implementations that can then upgrade their vulnerable, vulnerable instances. Um, so this is a learning experience that we actually had inadvertent disclosure at that time. Um, we quickly got out security patches and, and launched them or released them for all of the affected versions of DHS2. Um, we reached out to a wide list of our known security contacts for who are responsible for DHS2 instances in the wild, um, who received a confidential notification that this vulnerability existed and that they should upgrade to the, that newly released patch. Uh, we also informed them that we intended to, do, to uh, have responsible public disclosure of this vulnerability at a certain date in the future. Um, um, the, the majority or, or everyone that we know of in that group uh, upgrade, updated their server, their server instances to a patched version. And then in uh, just yesterday, June 23rd, uh, we uh, publicly disclosed that vulnerability uh, and released the patch. Um, and the patch releases were announced, sorry, to the public. We also applied for what's called a CVE, 
um, which was we have assigned a, a publicly disclosed uh, number that is uh, a reference to this particular vulnerability, which has been patched in those uh, released versions. Um, this is a pretty quick turnaround. The total time from first identifying the vulnerability to public disclosure was about 15 days. Um, probably in, uh, in the future, we intend to have more time between uh, discovery and fixing of an issue and public disclosure because we can have full embargoed um, uh, vulnerability uh, upgrade time or, or remediation time uh, for implementations uh, so that they can upgrade their instances that are affected uh, before we publicly disclose that that vulnerability exists. Um, during those 15 days, information was mostly embargoed, except for the inadvertent disclosure of, of merging the fixes a little bit early, um, which is something that was a new process for us uh, at the core team um, and is something that we are uh, yeah, proud that we were able to implement that, but we definitely have some learning experiences that we will take going forward. Uh, so what went well with this, uh, these processes in practice. Um, we responded very quickly and professionally to the uh, vulnerability as it came in and, and tried uh, to address it in a, in a responsible way. Um, we very quickly fixed, uh, identified and fixed the issue um, when, it, when it came in. Um, the patches were cut and published um, also in a, in a short time frame, and the, the processes just worked in, in terms of cutting those releases and publishing them. Uh, and everything was was uh, automated and used our used our uh, existing systems uh, pretty smoothly. Um, we were then able to discreetly notify a large group of known implementations, um, and this is something that we hadn't really done before. Um, but we were able to reach out to that large group and uh, get uh, positive feedback about uh, instances being upgraded in in uh, in a responsible or in a in a reasonable time frame. Um, and we actually achieved our, our goal of responsible public disclosure for the first time with, with one of these vulnerabilities. Um, and that's something that we're proud of as well. There are definitely some areas in which we need to improve. Um, the embargo, as I mentioned, was imperfect because we had a, a fix that was inadvertently published to the public repository. Uh, this could be considered disclosure to a very savvy attacker who happens to be monitoring a uh, DHS2 uh, repository and sees a, a fix go in. Um, obviously, the, the vulnerability still exists. So it's, um, it's only a disclosure in that it makes it a little bit more uh, noticeable, potentially, to somebody who isn't probing DHS2 for that vulnerability. Um, but it can potentially be a disclosure to, to those types of people. Um, Fixing vulnerabilities without disclosing what was fixed is a difficult task. And that's something that we're working on uh, uh, implementing in our process in the future. Um, but it involves an, a number of steps, a number of uh, kind of private forks of, of the DHS2 repository to be able to uh, implement those fixes, potentially on multiple branches, release those fixes, uh, disclose this the the source code of those updates to uh, particular implementations but not to the public until that public disclosure happens and that's something we're working on improving in the future um, another way area we can improve is that uh, because of that in, uh, um, imperfect embargo uh, the timeline was a bit rushed um, so we, we like i said it took us 15 days from uh, discovery of the vulnerability to public disclosure, including a uh, discrete notification of uh, the affected implementations that we knew about. Um, and uh, ideally, we'd like that to be a little bit more extended so that uh, those implementations have more time to respond and to upgrade their servers. Um, one of the nice things that we did have uh, in this case, and we should have in uh, in any critical vulnerability um, a, a patch or release is that the, the patch release only included the security vulnerability fix. And so it was a very low risk upgrade for affected instances. Um, so since 2.30, I believe we have had uh, uh, numbered patch releases that are uh, discrete um, releases on top of a major version stream. Um, and that allows us to basically say, if you're on the latest patch of 
a particular major version and patch releases should be very low risk um, upgrades. Uh, this one is as low risk as it possibly can be because it shouldn't include any other fixes or any other changes. Um, and so it's much, much easier to adopt those fixes in, in production environments in a quick way. Um, the last point here, something that we need, where we need to improve is that we, we need to maintain a list of trusted DHS2 security contracts, possibly contacts, probably with uh, NDAs in place in order to make responsible embargo disclosure to those security contacts, uh, allow them to uh, upgrade their instances and, and, and uh, secure their, their implementations uh, before that public disclosure. And with that, I will, um, yeah, so there, there's probably a, a number of questions that people have about this particular vulnerability or about our process or about our team. Um, I think we'll take maybe questions at the end unless any have come up in the chat that I want to address right now. Otherwise, I'll turn it over to Bob to talk about uh, securing DHS2 for implementers. Thanks, Austin. Great summary of our learning experience to date and improve, improving of process. Um, as you say, I think we've got a way to go and it's going to be a great post-mortem now as we sit and, and figure out what we've learned from, from this one. Um, okay, you're, I'm trying to change the slide because I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, I, having one slide to say how to implement a secure DHS2 system is, is you know, it's, it's, it's a bit crazy. But um, I, I did give a, a slightly longer presentation to the Tracker Implementation Academy uh, about a month back. I mean, probably the, those slides are, and, and that YouTube may still be found somewhere. Um, but if I were to summarize, um, I would say that the most important thing for um, an implementation to get a grip on its security management is, I mean, it sounds simple, but is to actually have somebody on your team whose job it is. And it's, it's kind of surprising, but I mean, in, the, in the Tracker Implementation Academy, we actually asked this question. So who on your team as part of your implementation is responsible for security aspects? And there was, I think, more than 50% of implementation said, well, no, they don't have that person. So that's the first thing it's got to be somebody's job and i know it can be hard because you might not have a um professionally qualified security consultant who you can just draw upon it might be some somebody who's got to learn on the job in a sense that matters less what matters more is it's somebody who it's in his job description to be concerned about security and that makes contacts for example what austin was talking about earlier if we had a list of of, of the security contact of every implementation um, that would have helped with the disclosure process uh, that person well, part of his job is to stay up to date with security announcements as austin was referring to uh, but it's also to have general oversight of the kind of organizational and configuration aspects and the technical aspects of the implementation. A big mistake that I have seen is that people take someone who's involved with the server administration and say, right, you're the security guy. Um, that shouldn't be the case. I think a security manager should have a much more... Um, much more of an oversight role. The job of the security manager is to make sure that the server admin guy is doing his job. Um, but if you bury security management down to that low technical level, then you're gonna miss out on lots of things. The second thing that's really important is to have a security plan. Um, and what constitutes a security plan is it's something that may make great material for, for an academy. I think we should do it, definitely. But um, a good starting point is look up ISO 27001 and look at this quite a lot of free resources around ISO 27001. ISO 27001 describes in quite general terms for pretty much any organization how to set about uh, managing your security um, without going into the details of 
what kind of SSL algorithms you're configuring or what have you. The kind of things that you would include in a, in a, in a security plan, are you have management tools like maintaining a risk, risk register, an inventory, how many instances do you have? Where are they? Uh, SOPs around how systems get installed. Um, something very few people implement and we could do better in terms of perhaps providing some templates on or things around incident response. I mean, from the software developer's perspective, incident response to things like vulnerability disclosure is something like Austin has just gone through. But in terms of an instance in the field, when you have when you have data loss or when you have when you have a suspected uh, breach or whatever it might be, what do you actually do next? If you don't have a plan for what you do next, then the chances are that you'll make a mistake that will make the problem worse. Um, it's often described to me as if you're standing on the side of the road and you step into the road, that's your first mistake. And then you see a car coming and then you run into the road and that's the mistake that kills you. Right. So having an incidence response plan, those are all kind of things that you put into your security plan. Backup and disaster recovery, probably the biggest issue that we've seen in implementations in the wild have been kind of self-inflicted injuries in a sense. They've not, they've, they've not been attacked by some malicious actor. They have simply made some kind of mistake because of having unclear processes and, and losing data that way. Version management, I mean, we keep trying to put this message out, I guess, but the, the security team, um, well, the software development team in general, uh, undertake to provide security management of the last three major versions of DHIS2. And so if you're on version 229, then you need to be aware that if there are vulnerabilities detected in version 229, they may or may not get fixed. But if you're on one of the latest three versions, then, then you're part of our management plan. Um, a big part of, of being on a major version then is to make sure that you keep up to date with the patch versions. But we'll talk about that. So I think I mentioned a bit in my next slide. The other thing is having lots of training and 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 messaging wherever we can have messaging. I mean, they're, they're, anybody who's worked with security a lot will know that security policies can be those kind of things that you know big masses of dusty piles of paper that sit in a drawer somewhere. You got to get the message out there, right? And use every opportunity of getting the message out. What I, I like to recommend is when we do academies, when you produce training material, um, whatever it is, have a standing item. Have it on all of your training material. There should be something called security considerations. And for end users, security considerations for end users might be to do with things like not sharing passwords. Um, try not to do like what I do and have millions of tabs open at the same time as working on my DHIS2, logging out rather than waiting for the session to time up, etc. Uh, I think, yeah, we should take the opportunity of, of all our training material, all our training events, to put in a little note on are there security considerations for this particular audience, um, even if there are not many or there may be many, at least the placeholder is there. Something I haven't mentioned in having a security plan, of course, is having audits. Um, audits are good for you. It's about it's like going to the dentist, right? They, 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 it's not very pleasant. Everybody hates being audited. Um, some implementations, I think, are fortunate, even though they don't think so, that they're subject to government audits. Uh, so there's a process every year you go through. It should be part of the costing plan of an implementation. You might have to pay to get an external audit done, but getting audited every year at least uh, is an important part of the cycle of, of security management. So those two things, right? having, having someone whose job it is and then making some kind of a plan. And the making a plan can be intimidating. You hear Bob talking about all these things, you might not be familiar with most of them. That shouldn't be a good excuse not to make a plan. In fact, that's the best excuse to start making a plan. A plan doesn't have to be perfect. And once you have a security plan in place of some description, then you've got something to improve. And so it's a cycle. So those three things, have somebody whose job it is, have a plan, and then make sure you have a process that ensures that you keep re refining the plan. Um, typically, what you see in a lot of corporate situations, you're 
your your chief information security officer is going to report on the monthly meeting to management. What's my progress? This is what my risks registers we looked like last month. This is what it looks like this month. Um, he might have a lot to report. He might have nothing to report. But if it gets put into the cycle, then um, you're on the road to producing something which you can improve over time. That's security management on one slide. Um, <laughs> limited, I know. Austin, what do I have on the next slide? I, I will just to kind of move away from very abstract things. I mean, there are a few very particular things that we thought we'd just take the opportunity to add in here, and some of which I've already mentioned about about keeping in touch with the last three major versions. People are very cautious about upgrades and understandably so. I mean, sometimes an upgrade can be a traumatic thing. Systems get broken, not everything always works properly. Um, obviously, when you do an upgrade, you should have, a again, a process around it. Upgrade a testing instance, have have users get in to, to um, test all the various functionalities to make sure nothing has got broken. There, because it's quite a bit of process around a major version, again, it's something you're frequently going to have to budget for. Um, major version upgrades can involve new training. There may be new interface features. There may be new whatever it might be. So as part of your, again, this is why security management is a management issue. It's not the, it's not the server admin, right? It should be part of your annual budget that you're going to do a major version upgrade at least once a year. Because we release once every six months, that would mean you'd never be more than two versions behind. Patch releases, as I've said, contain critical bug fixes and very often they can be related to security. So again, it's gotta be somebody's job to monitor when those patch releases are made and then to, to upgrade as, as, as quickly as possible. It shouldn't, I shouldn't have say this, but I've seen it quite a few times, even this last year, don't go upgrade your production instance um, without testing thoroughly on some staging or test instance and involve users in that. Make backups before doing an upgrade. We had an incident, oh, I won't name names, it wouldn't be fair. We, we had an incident in the country earlier this year. Somebody did an upgrade from 234 to 235. Everything was broken when they got to 235. The only thing they could think to do was to go back to 234. So they went back to the backup and they discovered they didn't have a backup. And so they were stuck on 235. And it took probably two, three weeks to get everything back up and running again. And a word of caution about backups, you know, we go to a lot of effort sometimes to secure our databases and secure our systems. And then we make backups and we send them around to one another on email or leave them lying on our laptops and in home directories and what have you. It makes good sense to have some kind of SOPs around the handling of backups. And yeah, probably my main message of the day, remember, it's not all about the back end. Yeah, um, it's a, it's a, much more broader concern being involved with security management of an implementation users users is probably it probably the most important thing to manage outside of the actual uh, the software installation a lot of cases we've got very often have very good processes around people arriving in the system and and get given user accounts and whatever but we've got very few, if any, processes around what happens when somebody retires from the service or, 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 or resigns or gets kicked out. Uh, many systems I know have probably, particularly the ones that have been going for a long time, might have 30% of the users who are now dead. Um, that's really not too much a, of a concern until the dead users start logging in. Um, and that happens, unfortunately, as well. So. Your security management needs to needs to have a, a kind of holistic approach. And as I say, tools like ISO 27001, it can be quite a good starting point. Um, and yeah, we're hoping to put a bit more work into developing more kind of um, perhaps, what can we call it, not dumbed down, but um, what implementation guidance around taking something which is complicated like ISO 27001 and putting it into a palatable format that we get the major aspects of it out. But these are the kind of issues which would be paramount. Austin, do I have another slide or am I done? Ah, this was, 
Yeah, the, this is this is from our presentation to implementers. Um, I think Austin has covered pretty much all those points already. Thanks. I'll take questions. I guess at the end, if we get a bit of time, happy to continue the discussion with anyone who wants to follow up. Sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, and I think uh, it it would be a very good idea for us to have uh, to plan a plan a security uh, training session um, of more than more than a couple hours um, to specifically target some of some of these hard security issues, um, and then also to uh, and, and I know that there are some of the training team as well on the on the call here to embed uh, security into all of our trainings as much as possible when 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 that makes sense. Um, I think that's a very good piece of advice for the, again, for the University of Oslo uh, outreach teams, but also for uh, implementations themselves as they're training users and, and, and that type of thing. Uh, so where do we go from here? We've talked a little bit about the new security team. We've talked a little bit about uh, the vulner vulnerability management processes that we um, have uh, implemented uh, and uh, put into practice in, in the last several weeks. Um, one thing that we talked a little bit about is that the, the security team is initially focusing uh, most of its effort on the security software hardening. So that's hard security of the software, the vulnerability management, um, making sure that there aren't uh, um, clear gaps in the security features of the software itself. Um, uh, a, an example, actually a good example of this is um, uh, Bob mentioned that uh, users, users might have died and no longer be able to log in. Uh, a feature that was just introduced in 2.36 of DHS2 is the ability to have a scheduled job to disable users who have not logged in after a certain amount of time. Um, I think that's a, it's a fairly simple feature, but it's something that everyone should think about and enable um, so that if uh, someone hasn't logged in for three months, uh, you disable that account and they need to manually activate it again. Uh, and you need to make sure that they're alive and who they say they are when they when they do that activation. Um, there are other features as well that have been coming out as, as kind of software features. Uh, but the next step beyond that is, is really building up our, our corpus of guidance for implementations uh, and particularly in the health sector, health implementations on top of DHS2 for privacy of data. Uh, as I mentioned, this is something that a lot of people at the, the UIO core team, as well as uh, at implementations around the world, are thinking about every day. Um, but it's uh, we we want to kind of collect a best practices set of guidelines and and coll collaborate on building up that that uh, set of documentation and guidance for implementations, so that we can uh, provide a kind of a, a, a standard way to build an, a secure DHS2 implementation. Um, this is, yeah, particularly interesting to, uh, relevant to, uh, as I mentioned, uh, personally identifiable information and longitudinal tracker data uh, in health systems. Um, in addition, as kind of the next steps for the security team and the security process that we've outlined um, is to continually improve that process. As, as Bob mentioned in, in the advice to implementers, it's the same advice to us is uh, make a plan and then continually revise that plan. So learn, learn from what happens and, uh, um, and continually think about security and how to embed it even more in, in everything that you do. So that's what we're doing with the, at the core team as well. Um, one of the first things that we'll be doing is publishing a, a post-mortem analysis of our handling of this recent vulnerability, um, the things that went well, the things that went uh, maybe could have gone a little bit better, um, and how we're in, uh, improving our processes to address those, um, those deficiencies in, in, the, in the initial um, uh, response, which I think went quite well and was much, much more... Um, responsible and uh, professional and and kind of respectful of, of our users than I think a lot of uh, a lot of other uh, systems in the, in the, the uh, ecosystem um, don't don't necessarily have those processes in place so um, it's good to see that uh, process going forward we'll also be uh, improving the documentation um, of that vulnerability management process we have uh, put a new um, 
kind of outline of that process on the uh, uh, security website or security page on the dhs2.org. Um, you can find that dhs2.org slash security, as well as uh, many of the things we've talked about here today uh, and disclosure of vulnerabilities, vulnerability management policy, uh, best practices and guidelines for implementations. Um, we'll also be looking into uh, publishing some security audit um, tooling to be able to uh, both automated and manual checks on DHS2 instances to be able to kind of uh, determine uh, to, to perform kind of a, a, a lightweight audit on those systems in an automated way. Um, this will hopefully prevent some of the, the low hanging fruit of implementations that have uh, totally open systems where everyone can access tracker data, for instance, or um, systems where they don't have the um, uh, disable users after a certain amount of time uh, enabled uh, and can can show the show a, a system administrator or, or a security manager um, what what pieces might need more investigation uh, and might have security vulnerabilities there and some of those will be manual processes or manual check boxes as well such as do you have a security plan do you have a security manager who is your security contact those types of things um, we're also ourselves as the, the University of Oslo uh, uh, core team, DHS2 core team, uh, hiring an uh, information security manager who will help to kind of expand this uh, security posture and strategy uh, and implementation uh, guidelines, support and guidance um, around security and privacy um, and particularly around uh, individual level data um, potentially. That's something that the, the security team um, and, and myself are kind of stepping into that role in the moment. Um, but we want to have someone who's dedicated to that and in a, in a management uh, position as well. Um, we'll also be publishing and promoting security and privacy recommendations for implementers, uh, as I mentioned, to kind of uh, help to promote that security, uh, um, that security management um, context and that security management um, uh, I forget the term that I used in the in the guidelines, but it was culture, um, security management culture uh, in implementations that are built around DHS2. Um, and obviously, we're still embedding uh, security into the development teams themselves and the features that we build, and building more security features on top of DHS2, such as uh, token authentication and some other things that are coming down the line. Uh, we've recently um, done some significant upgrades. Um, Morten Svanes, uh, our security engineer, has done some significant upgrades to some of the security infrastructure in the DHS2 software itself, uh, and implemented things like uh, OpenID Connect for uh, authentication and those types of things. Um, so we'll be pushing that forward as well. Going to reiterate the security principles um, and just very simply, uh, these are these are what we try to embody and try to uh, promote uh, in in the community: robust, formal, and predictable security processes, maximum transparency, full responsible disclosure, and strong security management culture. With that, uh, I think I can we can open it up for questions. I can also show the the dhs2.org/security website if we don't have too many questions, but I'm sure people are are uh, raring to raring to ask us some things. So let me go ahead and uh, see if there's anything in the chat or Martin or Bob, if you wanna shout out to me, if there's anybody, any questions that have come in so far. Yeah, there's been quite a few questions actually. Uh, I'm not sure where to start, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to be posting these in the community of practice, of course. Um, so actually, if uh, anyone wants to make a live question, uh, why don't you raise your hand uh, and we can answer that question here. Yeah, I've been, I've been answering questions as you were talking, Austin. Claudia has just answered some, has just asked us something there. Claudia, would you mind reading out? Martin, is she able to unmute? I can make it so. Go. Uh, hi. Hi. Can you hear me? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, very important topic that I have learned from you. I mean, I 
uh, I am from PAHO, but I, I wonder for the security uh, manager, does it, um, do you need a full-time job or can be somebody that uh, that is doing uh, other security things in other, of course that depends on the number of instances and all the stuff, but um, a, can you expand more about the need of uh, of a security a senior security manager. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Claudia. Um, I think Grant has pretty much answered you in the chat there. Um, look, uh, uh, an information security officer is quite a highly skilled management job. Um, so, yeah, in an ideal world, you want somebody. Um, full time, competent, and 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 trained in that area, but I mean we're all fully aware that, th that these people are not thick on the ground, and particularly with 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 um, working in the public service, it can take you ten years to create a new post, as as, as people will well know. Uh, I think one of the biggest dangers is to say, well, because we're still trying to recruit. A security manager or because we're still trying to create a post for a security manager we're not going to do security management um so yeah ideally yes you do want somebody uh, as good as you can get in in that security management post but um if you don't have one somebody and somebody reasonably senior within your project simply needs to be assigned to that role um, and they can learn the learn the basics as they go along. Um, some of the aspects of security management is actually not very complicated. Um, it's a little bit bureaucratic, requires a slightly bossy bureaucratic kind of person. Um, and there are quite excellent training courses available as well. Um, so, yeah. My answer to that would be much like Grant has said, best practice would be to appoint someone, but don't wait to appoint someone before you start implementing. The question that just came in is about a, a feature of DHS2, which is the, the audit system. And there is, there is an audit feature, you can find it in the documentation um, to monitor or basically to log what happens when uh, and by which users in the system, particularly in tracker implementations. Um, we also have a feature called Break the Glass, which you can learn about. It's also listed on our um, security uh, webpage, which allows a user to, uh, in an auditable way, request access to a, a tracked entity instance, for, instance, for example, that it, that user doesn't na naturally have access to. It might be from a different org unit um, that is be has been referred to their system or to their, to their org unit. Um, and you can enable them to basically uh, provide an audit message to say, why am I requesting access to this uh, person that's outside of my org unit, uh, assigned org unit? Um, that goes into the audit log and you can, you can review that later. So yeah, the answer is yes, there is an, an, uh, an audit feature in DHS2. Thanks, Claudia. Um, any other questions here? I'm going to go ahead and uh, open up this security page. Hopefully you can see it still. Can you see the security page of DHS2 while we're waiting for more questions? Yes? Yep. Yeah, great. Um, so yeah, the, this has been a, an updated uh, page about our basically what this what this presentation was about, um, our practices and policies for security in uh, the, the the core team, um, the principles that we've outlined, um, uh, the features that are available in the core DHS two and Android. We're expanding this today as well. Um, there are also uh, best practices and guidelines um, similar to what was presented today uh, for implementations, um, information about supported versions, uh, a, the vulnerability reporting and disclosure man, uh, policy that I mentioned. Uh, I'll share that in just a moment. Um, and a list of also the, the disclosed vulnerabilities that we had so far. Um, in, and that's the, the one that I mentioned today. Um, which you can see in this list and, and find the, the patched versions as well. 
Um, I'll show you also the disclosure pol uh, reporting and disclosure policy, which, as I mentioned, defines the scope, what is in scope and what is out of scope for um, uh, reporting vulnerabilities in, uh, in DHIS2 um, for security researchers or anyone that wants to do a, a pen, pen test or a penetration test against DHS2 and report those vulnerabilities to us. Um, we also have a, a disclosure policy here, and we uh, are um, happy to give credit to security researchers who help us to identify vulnerabilities and fix them in a responsible way. Yeah, thanks, Austin. I just want to draw people's attention maybe to the very, very first sentence on there where we say DHS2 takes security seriously. Um, I think. Then in terms of imp most implementations, when you talk to implementers, they will say the same thing, right? We, we take security seriously. But if you're hoping to stay out of jail, I mean, you, usually what will get you sent to jail is if you have a breach on your system. Um, and then when you get investigated, you need to be able to demonstrate. In most national legislation, it's pretty much like, if you can demonstrate that you have taken all reasonable efforts to prevent that breach to have happened, then you're not going to be legally um, um, uh, in trouble. Uh, and part of being able to demonstrate that you've taken efforts is to be able to have these kind of, to be able to point to your plan, right? To be able to point to your, your manager, to be able to point to your policies. And that's why I think it's been a big step forward for the DHS to develop a team to start having sort of formal processes in place like this. Um, but I think the same thing is true in implementations. Get things written down, establish, establish policies. They may be the very bits of paper that keep you out of jail. Um, there was a question here from, from Pete. Um, the, uh, the break the glass audits uh, and the audit log in general is in the, the database, so it is not, I don't believe there's a, an interface for it at this point, um, but the log is there and you can access it. Um, we're getting close to the end here. Does anyone else have any, any questions or um, comments, feedback, concerns? We're, we are transparent and trying to trying to learn as we go as well. So very, very open to any any comments that anyone has. Um, and we will also be looking to um, uh, build out our, our training material around uh, security management policies uh, and practices. Sounds like we do not have any more questions at the moment. Um, I think we try to end five minutes early so people have time to uh, go to the next session. So maybe we can uh, wrap it up here, unless anyone has any, any final thoughts. No final thoughts. OK. Uh, thank you, everyone. And um, uh, Please feel free to reach out to us. Also, uh, the, the entire security team is available at security at dhs2.org uh, if you have any questions or comments or uh, want to share any vulnerabilities.